Well, hello. It's uh, wonderful to be invited to talk to you today about the aerial archaeology of the Gwent Levels and their hinterland. Over the next 45 minutes or so, I'll introduce a bit about the history of aerial archaeology, and then I'll look at the techniques of how we do aerial recording, and then we'll look at this wonderful landscape from prehistoric times to Roman times to medieval and later times and see some familiar sites from the aerial perspective, but also look at some of the archaeological sites we've discovered in recent years, which tells us a lot more about the history of this rich landscape. Now we open with a view of Wentlug Level and Peterstone Gout in 2014. Uh, and this view really encapsulates the landscape we're talking about. Uh, superficially, it's a modern landscape we're looking at. We have villages and houses and farms and a golf course there. But we know these features are set within uh, a medieval framework of sea walls, of drainage uh, of medieval villages. And then we also know that that landscape itself was built on a Roman landscape. It was the Romans who first saw the potential of this fertile farmland and drained it and established some of the first sea walls. Uh, and their landscape fell into disrepair and is buried under the present one that we see. But also, at the edge of the farmland there, at the edge of the estuary, uh, this is where we have this special character, this exposure of the successive earlier layers of the Roman, Iron Age, Bronze Age, and back to the Mesolithic, 6 to 7,000 BC, these landscapes exposed on this seven estuary foreshore, uh, which peels back those layers of history. So we can see that time depth uh, and the amount of archeology span and the potential we have uh, in this very special landscape. Now, aerial photography has a very long history, uh, and uh, aerial photography in Wales dates back to around 1919, uh, when the Aerofilms Company first established their business in England and began flying the British Isles and recording some amazing views. Uh, and we're lucky that a few years ago, the Royal Commission in Wales, uh, together with the agencies in England and Scotland, uh, rescued these early era films pictures for the nation and scan them in. Uh, and so we now have incredible views like this view of Newport in 1921, uh, safe in the archive, and we can also uh, look at this online. Now, the era films uh, team are pictured there in their great de Havilland biplane in 1919. You can see the chap, the photographer, clutching both handles of his large glass plate camera. This must have been an awesome machine do aerial photography in an exposed cockpit, a heavy camera, and coming in low over Newport in this view in 1921, banking to get the right view, the engine of this biplane thundering over the townscape, shocking people, making them look up as well. Uh, so this would have been a very novel experience for people on the ground to see a biplane orbiting over their town. I look at the view it records, the market hall, the street awnings, the busy high streets, Newport Bridge, packed with people. We can see big sawmills uh, on those small wharfs by the side of the river uh, uh, Usk there as well. Uh, so we have a vibrant river scene here from the 1920s. And an early photograph like this gives us so much more than a map. A map is an interpretive view of the past, a cartographer's view of the past. Whereas in this photograph, we can see what was happening on that particular day that the picture was snapped. We can compare that 1921 view with our recent view of Newport. Uh, the landscape has changed, the townscape has changed, particularly the art center there on the waterfront, uh, has, and the waterfront has been reclaimed from that old industrial waterfront we see in that 1920s view. But here you can see the, 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 the beauty of an historic air photograph is you can very quickly with your eyes pick out the buildings that are standing in 1921 and those that survive today, like the market hall there, and others. You can make that comparison very quickly. And then we can compare back to the 19th century mapping for Newport uh, and see the names of particular pills and wharves, uh, the sawmills, the flour mills, and so on, to give that extra layer of information. And moving forward to 1929, another stunning aerial photograph from the Aerofilms collection. Uh, and look at all these buildings that have changed. Uh, we have another sawmill over the way between the two bridges here, the sawmill we're looking at here and the remains of the castle, indeed, wedged between the two bridges. And the uh, redevelopment of those roads in modern times and the placement of that big roundabout has demolished a lot of those buildings that 
were once close to the castle, uh, but we can still see it still hanging on in the townscape today. And there's the athletics track as well at the top of the picture. So these early photographs are a really valuable way to see how townscapes and the landscape have changed. We have other important historic air photo collections of the Royal Commission in the National Monuments Record of Wales. One of these is the Royal Air Force images that we have. After the war, uh, a lot of Royal Air Force pilots and aircraft were put into uh, work uh, doing photo reconnaissance around Britain to really improve our knowledge of the British landscape uh, and uh, improve mapping as well. And this is a great view. We can see on the top bar of the photograph, 19th of May, 1947, a view of Blyn Avon, the forge side. Uh, and the spoil tip of the workings of the center of Big Pit. Uh, and we can see from the early morning shadows, this is a morning view in May. Uh, so the RAF would have been up early over this landscape and snapping a view that really doesn't exist anymore. A lot of the uh, uh, tips and the workings in this view have been improved uh, and even improved away and, and redeveloped. Uh, so you would have had incredible Royal Air Force planes, sometimes photo reconnaissance spitfires and mosquitoes flying over the South Wales Valleys in these early mornings, getting these valuable views that we're fortunate still to have. Uh, and these are stereo pairs, these vertical photographs, that we can still put them together in a computer and pop up a 3D view uh, all those years later. So we began our specialist archeological reconnaissance program in Wales in 1986 with my predecessor, Chris Mutton. Uh, and after all those years of flying, we've got about 90,000 specialist air photograph catalog for Wales. We can see the map here uh, showing Newport and Cardiff, areas where we've got a lot of photographs, the city centres, the archaeological sites, the heads of the valleys there between Merthyr and Abergavenny as well, areas where there aren't any photographs, perhaps you haven't seen any archaeology to, to record, uh, or there's still things to be discovered in there as well. And there are gaps, particularly east Cardiff to Newport, where we have, have a lot of controlled airspace coming into Cardiff Airport. It's always difficult to get into uh, to do reconnaissance. And upper left there, we can see my flight paths from the last four years recorded on GPS. Lots of coastal recording over the last four years for a European project I'm involved in in Ireland and Wales looking at climate change. Uh, and there's a lot of central Wales and eastern Wales I need to get back to now next year to do some more area recording. Looking at techniques, uh, the standard platform we use for air photography is a Cessna 172, a four-seater light aircraft. The only airfield we're allowed to fly from legally now for air photography in Wales is Halfford West, down in Pembrokeshire. Uh, and you can see lower left there, the door open, that's Eric, our pilot, who lives in Cardiff, actually. Um, the front seat where I sit with my cameras, it's extremely small inside these aircraft. If you can think of a 1960s Mini, that's about as much room as you've got, as you've got in a shoulder to shoulder with a pilot with two cameras around your neck. But you get an excellent field of view out through the front window. Uh, and this plane is a responsive way to get up. Uh, if the light is right, the season is right, you know we've got archaeology showing, we can hire a plane with a day's notice and get into the skies to get those crucial photographs. This is a short video showing my colleague Dan in the front seat on a winter's day over Pembrokeshire, Ramsey Island. Uh, we orbit around, ask the pilot to bank the plane, open the window, snap a photograph, keep that lens out of the airflow of the, of the aircraft, and then we've taken that picture. And there's Ryan and Dan in the front seat, wrapped up warm against that winter weather. Uh, it's extremely cold up there in winter when you're, you've got the window open for air photography. And we have a lot of equipment in the plane as well, a couple of big professional Nikon cameras, a D810 and D850, and that's a 200 millimeter lens on the, the longest lens there, which is just what we need to get those detailed shots. A headset to talk to the pilot, maps, a GPS uh, equipment, uh, and also we can get ruggedized tablets nowadays with digital mapping on them to help us navigate in the air. But everything we need for a three to four hour flight without going back to the airfield for something we've forgotten. Now when we talk about aerial photography, a lot of people think about discovery, finding things that you can't see at ground level. And the way we do that is by looking for crop marks in drought summers. Now the diagram on the right, partially obscured by me, <laughs> shows a, an Iron Age uh, defended farmstead or a little hill fort, maybe about 200 BC, with a uh, bank built out of stony material, a ditch dug through the bedrock or the subsoil. Uh, and by the 1960s, the middle picture there, the farmer is improving that field for cultivation. A lump and a bump survives 
of the ditch and bank of the hill fort, but not much else. And so successive decades of ploughing will eventually flatten that field surface, as, as you see in the bottom picture. So in the present day, the field surface might be flat, but it's very difficult to remove those archaeological traces under the ground. The ditch in a drought summer, crops growing over that deep ditch will actually grow taller and greener because of the moist soil in that ditch. And if crops in a drought summer are growing over a Roman road or a stony footing of a building, they'll wither and parch out and turn yellow. And that's how we see crop marks from the air. The main picture on the left shows these great double circles uh, of a Bronze Age round barrow, about four and a half thousand years old, discovered near Aberystwyth a few years ago. We know it's not just where the farmer's been turning his tractor around in the field because the uh, field boundary cuts across the crop mark. So the crop mark predates the field boundary. And also there's other characteristics that look like a Bronze Age barrow. If you're lucky and you can visit these crop marks on the ground where they're still showing, as you see at the bottom, you can see what we're seeing. It's just a thickening of grass and weeds in that stubble field that's shown as buried ditches. And we actually were able to take a measurement of this site, 43 meters diameter. And with a bit of rain, that mark will vanish in a few days and disappear. So when these crop marks are showing in drought summers, we have to be airborne at just the right time to record them. Sometimes these marks can be dramatic. This main picture shows a Roman fort in Caradigion at Trauscoid showing in 2018. And we have the grid pattern of the Roman roads within the fort, separating barracks and headquarters buildings, showing uh, the more clearly than they ever have done since this was discovered in the 1950s. So it shows you this buried archaeology on the, under the ground. Now, in 2018, we had a very successful year in Wales. We found many, many new sites in the drought. Uh, and we published a new paper, me and a couple of colleagues, on the Roman discoveries. And that was published this year. And that hit the press. You see a BBC press release there from the 7th of June this year about all the new Roman sites we discovered. And that brought these crop marks back into the press. Now, this year, we've had an odd year in 2020. In February, we had the wettest February on record. But by May, we had the second driest May on record for 124 years, with crop marks showing everywhere. I couldn't fly this year to record them. But on my bike, I was able to cycle out to Trouscoid and record the Roman road, this one here, as it's showing on the ground. And that's what you're seeing as a crop mark, this parch mark of a road built 1700 years ago by Roman soldiers uh, and showing again today. In the 2018 crop mark season, we had some very busy flights and very long flights. Everything was parched in the southeast of Wales. Caffilly Castle, I mean, that's an inland site at the foot of the South Wales Valleys. Look how parched it looks uh, after that record drought. Scanfrith Castle showing parched marks of a well and other buildings within the keep. And this is a flight we did on the 19th of July, 2018, from Halford West, when we set out in the morning from Halford West up through North Wales uh, to Rith in the Vale of Clwyd, crop mark recording, north to Prestatyn, down to Welshpool for lunch uh, and get ourselves uh, sorted, get the cameras back up and, and, and change memory cards. South, down to the Brecon Beacons, recording Roman forts and new sites down to Chepstow, and then back to Halford West. Uh, nearly 700 photographs taken on that particular flight. So it's a very long days, but this is what you need to do to record these archaeological sites. If you haven't got access to a plane, there are other things you can look at. Google Earth has got some very good imagery on it nowadays from the 2018 drought summer. Uh, now, Google Earth, Google Maps always says satellite for the view, but it's not really satellite imagery for Wales. These are vertical air photographs commissioned usually by the Welsh Government and local authorities and then loaded onto Google Earth when they're no longer needed. Uh, this is a bit of well, South West Wales near Cardigan in Ceredigion, and they can see a crop mark enclosure showing here on the, the Google imagery, and this is our photograph of it from 1936. So it's, it's a pretty good place to go and look for crop marks. And you can see how crop marks look in a drought. Every field is showing, a bit like an x-ray. We're seeing all the subsurface features, the geological cracks in the bedrock, uh, ditches, banks, pits, uh, almost ignoring the layout of the present day field system. So when they have a really good crop mark season, the view is incredible. Other aspects of our national flying program, we do monitoring of uh, protected sites and parklands and gardens. For the last five years or so, we've been monitoring marsh parklands and gardens for Cadu. Uh, and this is a view we took of Rupera in March 2018, with a lot of clearance going on on the greenhouses and the 
swimming pools and the ponds as well. So we record, if you like this, it's, it's a very important uh, stock take of what's happening on the site. And you can see by June of that year, uh, everything is grassed over, looking a lot better as well. So a lot of clearance going on at Repera in 2018. So it's important we get these new views for the historic record. We also monitor scheduled monuments like Tumbalam here, uh, the Iron Age Hill Fort and Mott and Bailey, uh, just above Newport. Uh, and this is in the 19th of July 2018, when most of the South Wales Valleys had brush fires and uh, hot, sort of grassland fires as well. So it's so very dry. Uh, and the pilot couldn't fly through the smoke uh, with a fire at Tumbalam here because it's a hazard uh, to fly. Now, this is me photographing the site across the pilot's lap. Uh, a very sad sight to see the site on fire. And then CADI uh, commissioned some drone surveys afterwards to record the damage on the monument here. We're also recording aspects of the modern landscape and the recent landscape. Uh, we have uh, modern views that are historic in themselves. Here we have the Art Centre at Newport being built in 2003 and as it stood in 2005. And with all these development projects, big buildings, bypasses, motorways, the developer will also uh, be taking their own photographs. But my experience is that 20 years down the line, it's very difficult to find where those photographs are or who owns the copyright and so on. So when there are big changes in the Welsh landscape, new civil engineering projects, projects as well, we will be doing air photography of those. And one particular thing we've been busy with lower left is the nomination of the Slate World Heritage Landscape and Gwynedd, North Wales, for the last couple of years. Uh, and here's a view of Penryn, Slate Quarry in North Wales on a beautiful May day a couple of years ago. And it's aerial views like this of the present day landscapes that can really help sell the cultural importance of those landscapes uh, for world heritage status. Now, looking at techniques and how we approach air photography, this is a diagram we've had prepared now for the European project I'm working on called Cherish to get climate change and coastal heritage in Wales and Ireland. Uh, and in Cherish, we're using a toolkit approach. We're using every method at our disposal to record archeology span from number four, the aeroplane, which I'm talking about tonight, number three, satellite imagery, number one, airborne laser scanning, number two, drone survey, which I'll talk about as well, down to things like number 11, marine scanning offshore for Welsh coast, and even techniques like number five, geophysics and number six there, people doing peak coring to find out that past uh, episodes of climate change a few thousand years ago from peat, which is the sort of techniques that Martin Bell and his colleagues are using in the seven levels. Uh, so in our Cherish project, we're using all these techniques, and this is how a modern archeological project approaches recording of the ancient landscape. Now, airborne laser scanning, LIDAR, is a particularly powerful method for recording the landscape. In our Cherish project, we commissioned new airborne laser scanning of six of the Welsh islands uh, in 2017. And this is Puffin Island as an example. Puffin Island off, just off Anglesey coast has a 12th century church tower on it and an early medieval monastery. But most of the island is heavily wooded and covered in uh, low vegetation here. So you can't really see the archeology span from the air. Now this is a 25 centimeter LIDAR survey. So every pixel is about this uh, high resolution, it's about as long as your hand really, it's very, very high resolution. And the LIDAR, the laser scanning from the airplane can penetrate woodland and vegetation to show you what's underneath that on the ground. And so we can strip off that woodland on Puffin Island and reveal underneath it, the remains of the early medieval monastery and later church, field boundaries and cultivation on the island that nobody's ever seen before. So LIDAR is a very powerful method. And we'll see some examples of that in the Gwent Levels area. We also have drones for surveying archaeology nowadays. And people say, well, you've got a drone. You don't need an aircraft. Well, actually, we still need both. Uh, I'm a qualified drone pilot now. You have to be for doing archaeology. But the Cessna aircraft still provides the only way to do national air survey. We can fly up to 1,000 feet. It goes along at about 130 miles an hour within the rules of visual flight, VFR. So we have to fly during the day and avoid clouds. But if I want to survey the whole of South Wales from Halford West to Swansea to Cardiff to Chepstow in three hours, I need a Cessna aircraft. If I'm doing a survey of Redwick Village uh, or a part of Newport Town, and I want a very detailed model or a view of that particular building or, or town, 
then the drone is the best way to do it. But only up to a 400 feet limit, to stay clear of civil aviation, and also within visual line of sight, it's about half a kilometer. So if you can't see the drone, then it's dangerous. You need to know where that drone is and bring it, bring it back as well. So there are very strict rules governing drone use. But drones are a very powerful method of survey. This is an example from a coastal promontory port we're studying for our cherished project in North Wales near Carnarvon called Dinas Dinsley. And firstly, we can survey that port with a drone by programming in a flight path, and the drone will just take off and start flying a flight grid of that port for about a two centimeter accurate model. And it will come down and land when it needs a new battery and then take off again. The middle picture shows the eroding cliff face uh, and the beach at uh, Dinas Dinsley, but that's not a photograph, that's actually a digital model in the drone survey showing grass and sand slumping. From that very accurate digital model, we can print 3D model of the fort. We've taken this into schools to show children, and they love it. You can actually have a whole promontory fort on the school table. And then we can do digital products from that. So uh, a website called Sketchfab, we can mount these 3D models which you can rotate on a computer at home. So if you search for Cherish Project Sketchfab, you'll see various Irish and Welsh promontory forts. So, Drone surveys are a wonderful way to make new records of these sites. Let's turn to the South Wales landscape we're talking about, the Gwent levels, uh, and look at some of the aspects of the history and archaeology here. This is just an overview, looking east from Goldcliff in the foreground, to Whitson and Redwick, Magor Pill in the middle distance, where the Magor ship came up all those years ago, Roman vessel, off into the second seven crossing, uh, the Prince of Wales Bridge, as it's now called in the distance, and the tide ebbing now over the Seven Estuary in this view as well. And looking uh, west as well from just beyond Chetstow, we can see it's such a rich landscape that we have here. We can see in the foreground, the side of Heston Break near the Chamber Tomb, Port Skewart Hill, which has a Roman building on it, potentially a temple overlooking the Seven Estuary in Roman times, Subbrook Promontory Fort from the Iron Age, Magor Pill in the middle distance, and the uh, second uh, seven crossing there as well, cutting through the Gwent levels as well. So a rich history, a rich tradition of use of the seven estuary, and trade and conflict in this uh, particular part of southeast Wales. What an interesting landscape to study. Going back to prehistory, we have some very visible monuments still surviving in what is quite a well-developed landscape nowadays. Down at Heston Break, from about three and a half thousand BC, or thereabouts. We have a chambered tomb with a couple of portal stones still standing on a site hillock. Uh, I last visited there, I was about 17 years old. There's a big bull in the field, I, th I seem to remember, but I still managed to get to see the chambered tomb. And then from a slightly later period, late Neolithic or early Bronze Age at uh, Trelech, we have Harold stones, quite a rare megalithic stone alignment for this part of Wales. The central stone shaped into a cylinder with two big cut marks on its face. So uh, a very rare survivor of quite a major prehistoric ceremonial monument for the Trellick area in its time. Uh, and we're very fortunate these stones still survive and weren't carried away or broken up in previous centuries. But there are major sites out there still to discover. Neolithic henges are still incredibly rare monuments in Wales. We have about 15 that we know about. And these date from about three, three and a half thousand BC like Stonehenge in, in Wiltshire. And in 2010, we recorded crop marks of a previously unrecorded henge near Newbridge on Usk, the southern edge of the Usk Valley, just for the Celtic Manor Golf Course. A huge uh, elliptical uh, monument with broad ditches and at least one main entrance into the enclosure here. So we can tell it's an Neolithic henge. Inside, we'd expect post settings or stone settings. And we can see it's in a riverine position tipping off the slope, looking at the, the river there as well, potentially linked to rituals or people approaching on boat. So it's a significant discovery for South Wales, this Neolithic Henge, uh, and an important component of how we understand the Neolithic in this part of Wales. With these reclaimed levels, the Gwent levels and, and the Caldicott levels as well, uh, you don't have to dig very far into the ground to get archaeology. And this was made very clear in late 1980s and 1990, uh, during the Caldicott Lake excavations. Now, I had my first ever excavation in Kaiawent, Roman town in 1990, uh, as a youngster. Uh, we went to see the Caldicott excavations when they were running. 
uh, and uh, they were digging an ornamental lake and discovered uh, bits of preserved wood, uh, including plank, uh, planks remaining from a Bronze Age boat and timber from an Iron Age and Bronze Age platforms and trackways as well. And um, you can see the poly tunnel there standing, it's very difficult excavating wet prehistoric wood. You've really got to keep it wet as well. Uh, but you don't have to go very far into the ground around here to hit really good archaeology. But there is uh, other archaeology to discover as crop marks uh, down there in Mathern and Newton Green. A few years ago, we discovered the crop marks of a Bronze Age barrow. And that's in a very watery place. There would have been a lot of wetland here in the Bronze Age, 2,500 BC. A lot of water, a lot of rivers. And still, we have these big burial monuments built in this landscape. Uh, so there's still a major sites to discover. In the Iron Age, from about 700 BC, we have the rise of hill forts and promontory forts. And one of the biggest in this part of Wales is Subbrook Promontory Fort, right down there at the Severn Crossing, very close to Black Rock, the Roman ferry terminal. And it's very likely this fort was built here to maximize trade and contact with the Severn Estuary. Excavations here have revealed Iron Age occupation, Roman occupation, and medieval occupation. Uh, simply put, this site would have been too good to ignore in later centuries. But this is the only promontory fort we have until, or heading west, until we get to sort of Barry Penarth and west to the Vale of the Morgan Cliffs. So it's quite a rarity in this part of Wales. And we can see here the recently demolished paper mill just next to it as well. So an interesting site. And there are stacks of Iron Age promontory forts, or sorry, Iron Age enclosures and Iron Age forts in the, the Gwent landscape, not all of which are visible. You'll see on maps just east of Cardiff at Castleton, the Penelan Hill Fort is marked near the M4 corridor, uh, but it's not surviving really as a, as a very good earthwork nowadays. But it's such a major construction. It shows most dry summers as a, as a crop mark. You see the entrance here. Probably a Bronze Age barrow is showing here as well as a crop mark. In 2018, we discovered a major enclosure complex north of Chepstow, uh, north of Wincliffe, uh, which seems to represent a, a complicated site of polygonal enclosures, at least three big enclosures right on the bend of the wide gorge. And it suggests we have a Silurian power base here, pre-Roman tribal power base. Uh, very interesting discovery that we didn't know about uh, three years ago. Incredible what's still out there to discover. LIDAR, airborne laser scanning, can also help us discover things under woodland and under trees. And uh, back in 2010, a chap called Bryn Gethin, who works in Warwickshire, I discovered this a hill fort at the Knoll Penhow by browsing a publicly available LIDAR on the Slayer portal here. If you search for Slayer portal LIDAR, they'll come up with uh, a browser. You can look at this. So a patch of woodland that nobody's ever looked into, and underneath it's a nice Iron Age fort. And Bryn Geth has discovered quite a few Roman roads, Roman forts, and, and things in Wales over the years. Uh, so he's, he always produces really good discoveries. Now, often we're asked by Martin Bell and the Reading team to uh, survey the Severn Estuary and survey some of their excavations in the Severn Estuary. Uh, and it's really this land estuarine interface where all this archaeology is popping out. You can see the view from Goldcliff here that I showed earlier on. Um, back in August of 2011, we had a severe low tide and Martin Bell's team was working. And you can see the estuary is really drained. Uh, looking up from Port and the Grounds, we can see this edge of the peat bed, this peat shelf, where everything is eroding and revealing archaeology and preserved timber. Uh, and we have here on the shelf footprints from the Mesolithic, Iron Age buildings, cattle hoof prints from the Iron Age, a huge amount of archaeology being exposed. And we're lucky enough to have uh, provided air photographs in the past to Martin Bell's publications too. Uh, back in uh, August uh, 2011, uh, we got in low over Martin Bell's team. We can see them working here with a water pump to clear uh, some of their excavations. We can see they're working and focusing on these gravel riverbeds, which still survive out onto the, the peat shelves here as a focus for prehistoric activity. It's great getting these low level records of Martin's work in the past, uh, but nowadays these are the type of examples where a drone in your backpack would be a very good way to, to respond to the recording going on here. You have a few hours when the tide is right for working, and when those sites are exposed and cleaned up, you get the drone airborne to do some mapping. So sometimes an aircraft is right, sometimes a drone is right. And we have some incredible views in the archive 
from these very low tides along the seven estuaries. Here we are, uh, February 2016, and it looks as if somebody's pulled the plug out of the seven estuary. Such a draining of the, the water levels here. The second seven crossing standing out proud on the bedrock of the estuary there. So remarkable views uh, showing uh, what important waterway this, what a dynamic waterway this is uh, for preserving, presenting this archaeology along its uh, northern and southern fringes as well. So, you know, when we're lucky and get the light just right, we can get these really historic views from the air. We have an interesting landscape here when we come to the Romans. Uh, this is Kiawent, Roman town, with excavator remains at Pound Lane of Roman buildings and shops, and then parch marks showing all the buildings that still survive under the ground. <laughs> a lot of these are trenched by the, the Edwardians, so we know where they are. And in dry summers, they show uh, again from the air. But this is a contested landscape in Roman times. Uh, we had a, quite a battle between the Silures and the Romans to, uh, before it was won and settled. Uh, this southeast part of Wales is where we have the majority of Roman villas that we know about. But back in 2018, uh, me and a colleague, Geoffrey Davis, published a map in Archaeology Cambrensis of the villas that we knew about in Wales, and new ones continue to come up. But there aren't that many. You see, 32 known and possible Roman villas in Wales. These are still quite rare. And we have great sites like Wincliffe Roman Villa, which has been known for a long time, north of Chepstow, that's a protected monument. 20 meter long stone building. We can see the floor plan very clearly in this aerial view from 2018. And the, the view is almost so clear, you almost don't need geophysics on a site like this. Uh, Christ Carnine at Basileg, uh, east of, uh, west of Newport, discovered in 1996 a Roman villa. Uh, it was suspected as a Roman site uh, much earlier in the 90s when this pipeline was put through and uh, Dr. Edith Evans from the Gordon Gwent Trust found uh, box flu tile from a Roman site. It's only in 1996 we got the crop marks to show uh, the Roman villa and its attendant barn, the, tithe, uh, the, the estate barn there where all the uh, arable from the land would have been stored. And we have interesting sites like this, just west of Kaya Went, which has come out from air photography in the last 10 years. But we don't have a villa building as such to see, but it's certainly a Romanized farm with these uh, fields extending around. And this unusual circular structure within it as well, which may be a temple or maybe a roundhouse, we don't know. Uh, but very interesting sites like this coming out of the South Wales landscape. And we have Roman villas very close to the Seven Estuary as well. Here we are uh, down near Chepstow, uh, Stoop Hill Roman Villa, marked by the arrow. We have the firing range down here on the levels, the Seven Crossing, uh, and Black Rock in the distance there, this famous ferry port and separate promontory fort. So this is always a place where the Romans are crossing, and prehistoric people are crossing, and obviously a very good spot uh, to build your wonderful country house, your Roman villa. Uh, Stoop Hill was discovered in the 1970s from aerial survey and doesn't always show, but in 2018 we had a very biting drought and we saw the building again. This shows how we can work on air photographs to get more information out of them. This is my view out of the Cessna in 2018 of Stoop Hill Roman Villa. There's the building, there's the enclosure, good sense of scale from lorries and cars on the motorway there. Uh, and then when we get back to the office, we can use Adobe Photoshop to rebalance the red values, particularly of that photograph. And it draws out so much more detail of the villa enclosure, the stone building, other structures within it, and it shows it much more clearly. So we do need to do more work on these air photographs sometimes to reveal uh, all that hidden information. And these sites continue to come up. This was a site that came up in 2019, not a particularly good crop mark year but near Shy Newton, just north of uh, the Carwent military range. We had two enclosures, a rectangular structure with sharp angled corners, which looks like a villa enclosure, which, or, or at least a Romanized farm, shall we say that, up near Shy Newton. And this is now being explored uh, by the local history society, so that's good news. And there are other mystery sites out there which look Roman, but we don't quite know what they are. Uh, these Ifton Manor uh, crop marks uh, west of Caldicott have been showing since the 1980s. Uh, and we should have a rectangular-ish enclosure. Looks Roman, but it's a bit wobbly. The Romans like to build things very, very smartly and neatly. Another one, a rectangular enclosure here and a circular enclosure. But then we have the bands of bedrock showing in the, uh, in the crop as well. These are natural 
grip marks of cracks in the bedrock that we have to learn to ignore when we're looking for archaeology. But these may be Roman or prehistoric sites here at Ifton Manor, but they've never been investigated, so we don't know much more about them. Sometimes we have unequivocally Roman discoveries. In 2018, near San Vashes, uh, we discovered this new Roman fort, a small fort, which lies almost equidistant between Caerwent and Caerleon on the Roman road. And we can see the inner enclosure, the outer fort enclosure, and the annex here. And uh, this distance between the inner and outer rampart is critical. My colleague, Geoffrey Davis, who's a Roman expert, uh, asked me what the distance between the inner and outer ditch was, and I said it's 12 meters, because we've measured it and mapped it. And he said that's perfect, because in the Roman military manuals, and the Romans always built by the book, they specified, or the equivalent of 12 meters in Roman uh, measures between the inner and outer ditch, as being a standard javelin throw length for a soldier on the inner rampart to defend the fort against uh, attackers. That's a javelin throw between the inner and outer ramparts there. This fort was built close to two upstanding Bronze Age barrows, now showing us crop marks, these two circles here. And this Bronze Age barrow has a keyhole cut in it here. And we think that might be where they had a tile kiln, a Roman tile kiln, so that the, the burial mound was converted into an industrial feature by the Romans. And we have this also occurring in Hindwell and Radnorshire as well. Uh, so a lot of interesting information you can get from a crop mark like this. But one thing we're missing until about 2009, 2010 was any indication of how the Romans were fighting with the locals here. We know from documents, from historians like Tacitus, that there was about a 30 year battle between the Silures tribe, who were very resistant and stubborn, and the incoming Romans. Uh, and the Silures even defeated Roman legion at one point. And back in 2006, uh, Jeff Davis and Becky Jones, a couple of Roman specialists, were saying, well, look, given the evidence for the ferocity of the fighting, we should have more temporary marching camps, these military camps in the landscape, showing how the Romans were waging their campaigns. But we had none in the whole county of Gwent. And 2009 to 2013, we started to piece together one of the largest Roman camps in Wales at Llanqueo Farm at Usk, that we now know about. So that's our first camp. And in 2013, uh, we discovered the second Roman camp, Kilcrow Hill, uh, just east of Caerwent, uh, which is the, one of the smallest Roman camps in Wales in the marches. Uh, I was overjoyed when we got the Kilcrow Hill Roman marching camp, the second only marching camp in, in this part of Wales, southeast Wales. So a major discovery on that particular flight. And we can see Kilcrow Hill has a very interesting location. It's only two kilometers from the Severn Estuary. So it may have been a first incursion by the Roman army into this landscape. But look, it overlooks the later Roman town of Caerwent, where the Silurians were settled. So they have a military fortification in a landscape later settled by the tribe. Uh, so what was actually going on here? It's very interesting. Now, in 2018, I was doing uh, air photography over five lanes, which lies west of, of Caerwent. The five lanes, the field is scheduled because it's got a nice Roman villa here and lots of field boundaries and old enclosures, which I'm always looking at each time I photograph them. So I took some photographs of this field, a uh, lovely picture of all these uh, uh, field boundaries. I thought I'd map these in the autumn, finally, to make a detailed map of, of the archaeology of this field. And come October of 2018, I went back to this photograph, rebalanced those red, green, and blue values in the, in the image, that came out with quite a surprise. Hiding in this photograph, and this field has been photographed by photographers for 50 years, hiding here, these two semicircles here, showing the Roman calviculi gates of the third Roman marching camp in Gwent to be discovered. Uh, quite a small camp here, but it's been hiding in plain sight all these years. These outturned claviculi gates are very rare. There's about eight Roman camps in Britain which have these outturned gates. These are a real rarity and might imply a different invasion forces building this camp. This just shows you can't stop surveying the landscape. There's always more archeology span to be found. And the position of these two camps is starting to make uh, Carwent look very interesting. We have Clanmellanwood Hill Fort here. Uh, that is a power base in the landscape. But look, we have Kilcrow Hill, Roman camp, and five lanes equidistant either side of Kai went where the Silurians were settled. Uh, and this may imply now, actually, which some people have suggested in the past, 
the Carmen is actually built on a Roman fort. There's another Roman fort under the civilian town. Uh, so this was a militarized landscape before it's finally settled. Uh, but what other discoveries will we make in this landscape in the future? We have to wait and see. When we come to the medieval period in this landscape, we have some uh, major structures, a major reworking, a re-engineering of the Gwent Levels landscape for farming and trade. And Caldercott Castle remains a hugely impressive masonry building in what would have been then still quite a wet landscape, quite a watery landscape. A lot of rivers, a lot of wetlands to reclaim. And yet we see the foundation of a major motte with a stone keep uh, on top of it, the later uh, stone gatehouse as well. And Caldercott Castle exploiting the same critical position near the Severn Estuary as Kaiwent Roman Town exploited and Subbrook Promontory Fort exploited. They're all in this same zone, uh, the, the best crossing point, and all this coastal trade coming in as well. We can see uh, an air photograph in 2013 of Caldercott under parched conditions, which shows up stone buildings within the castle, but also remains of what looks like a big defended enclosure here, which may be an Iron Age defended site. So maybe that Iron Age site was still visible when the castle builders chose this spot to build their later castle. And all through the Gwent uh, and Peterstone levels, uh, we have uh, a rich pattern of medieval villages, medieval churches, uh, a landscape that's built on water, sea walls, drainage systems, uh, ploughing regimes that allow you to work this wet landscape, but in return and in reward, very fertile farmland. And we can see Redwick Church here and its cluster of houses around and this great plaque surviving in Goldcliffe Church recording this great 1606 flood as well. <clears throat> and we have some protected sites within this landscape. Goldcliffe Moated Site is protected. And on the Fair Portal LIDAR, we can see the moated site within its wider enclosure. Uh, so uh, some very many uh, interesting bits of medieval archeology span still surviving in this landscape. But there are still surprises to be had. A major building, uh, in medieval times would have been the Benedictine Priory at Goldcliffe that we have uh, documentary records for and a lot of information about, but nobody would actually be able to pinpoint exactly where that priory was. Um, and I understood Time Team even did some geophysics here a few years ago when they were doing a piece about Martin Bell's work in the estuary. Uh, in 2010, in a very hot May period, I was lucky enough flying over Goldcliffe to spot major stone buildings, an aisle structure here with wings projecting each side, uh, earthworks behind of an enclosure, more stone buildings here, and it seemed that this was the position of that Benedictine Priory rediscovered. I uh, was in touch at the time with Rick Turner and Jeremy Knight and Edith Evans to check what we'd found and we were able to publish this as well. Uh, but you never know when these major buildings, these big discoveries uh, will be made. We have to always keep looking. And the LIDAR remains an important way to look at the landscape. Uh, we know in 2010, uh, this moat at Magor Pill was discovered by Bryn Gethin, that man I mentioned earlier on, just browsing the publicly available LIDAR. Uh, so that's a major motor site, wasn't known about until 2010. And just browsing for this lecture, there are earthworks here at Summer Lees as well. Not a motor site, but a cluster of buildings. Maybe these were only historic cottages. I haven't done the tide map research and so on on this field to see what they were. But these are not currently on our historic environment database. They're not on the Glamorgan Gwent database either. So it's a site that we don't know about yet. So we must keep searching. And a lot of this work can be done by people at home, looking at the Fair Portal, looking at Google Earth to see what is still out there, what surprises we still have on the landscape. And talking about surprises, let's conclude by looking at some of the modern landscape that we have to record. The modern landscape's changing remarkably fast. Uh, and the aerial photographer has a responsibility to document these structures alongside the Roma forts and the hill forts. And here we have the seven crossing here, standing proud at low tide that we saw earlier on. Uh, but some surprises, if you fly over the television studios in Roastlock in Cardiff Bay, uh, you can see the Kumderi village, the Pobola Kum village there, uh, with its flat houses and its high streets standing out. And that's right next to Holby City, the Holby City set just next door. Uh, so it's amazing flying over these television studios and looking down to see uh, these little villages built in the middle of Cardiff. 
an incredible view to see. Even some of our major industrial complexes are changing all the time. Now, San Juan Steelworks used to be a major uh, point uh, to navigate uh, from as we flew east from Halford West past Port Talbot Steelworks, uh, Cardiff, Barry Docks, uh, and San Juan Steelworks. And here you can see between 2004 and 2005 dramatic changes with the demolition clearance of this site. Now we have housing built, being built on part of this site. So things don't last forever, and it's always important to get that picture pictorial record. You may have remembered recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in Wrexham, uh, Wrexham was in the news because a 20th century concrete police station, this great tower, was demolished. That's quite a significant 20th century building. Uh, there weren't, it wasn't able to be protected or preserved, uh, but we knew it was going to be demolished. So we were able to do some detailed recording on the ground. But also, I got in there last year with the Cessna, and we did some recording as much as you would with the drone, taking photographs in a circle around it. You see there's into a computer program, and that pops up a 3D model of the building. <laughs> so that's our digital 3D model of the building. And that's the building to being demolished last week. Uh, and we now hold the only 3D data that allows you to reconstruct that building in the future. So these are ways we can record these sites, even if they are going to be lost. And look at that lower right. Who would have thought the second seven crossing toll booths would be an historic picture? This is a shot from 2018. This view doesn't exist anymore. It's all being cleared away. So this landscape is always changing. There are some critically important parts of our modern landscape. Combram was a Mark I new town, uh, master plan published in 1951 and built thereafter. Uh, and my colleague, Susan Fielding in the Royal Commission, is currently doing a big study, time with that anniversary next year in 2021, of the construction of Combram. Uh, so a very important townscape, a lot of sculpture, a lot of key 20th century buildings, which require further study uh, and further uh, attention to be paid for them as we go uh, forward into the future. So we can reflect on the changing landscape. Here we have Uskmouth and Newport. Uh, we have solar farms, wind turbines arising in that landscape. Um, what a different landscape from when the aerofilm photographers came over here in 1921 and their great de Havilland biplane buzzing over this uh, landscape looking for photographs to document. Uh, always changing from Roman times from prehistoric times onwards. Now I haven't been able to do any air photography this year during lockdown. I'm hoping to restart flying during winter, but there are other people who are flying, and I've been following this year on Twitter the National Police Air Service for Southwest Region, They're based out of St Athan Airfield, and they often uh, <laughs> post air photographs of Southeast Wales um, during their sort of crime fighting work. Uh, just the other week, on uh, early November, they posted this great view of Kai Leon. So I'd recommend following the MPAS uh, just for these amazing views of the South Wales landscape through the year. And Google Earth, as I said, is a very good resource to scour over. Uh, lots of them there haven't been seen and uh, recognised yet, so do keep looking for archaeology on Google Earth. There's the Uskmouth Power Station 3D model there as well. There are sources you can go to online to find out more. Our online database is covlane.gov.uk, so you can type in Goldcliffe or uh, so, uh, so, uh, Redwick or Newport and get up detailed records and photographs. This is Goldcliffe Church here to find out more about the sites that we have on our database. Historic Wales, if you search for that, has everybody's databases combined, the National Museum of Wales, the Morgan Gwent Archaeological Trust and others. It's still a very good source to see that. And Corf Cymru, uh, is CADU's website uh, to show listed buildings and scheduled monuments. So if you're in a village or a town, you want to know if your phone box is listed or the church is listed, that's the best website to go to. So I recommend it. Uh, and it's time for us now to turn around. I've kept you long enough. Turning the plane around at Chepstow. There's the tailplane of the, of the aeroplane back in 2019. And the River Wye there and the Severn branching off into the distance. And we've got about an hour and a quarter's flight ahead of us to get back to Halford West Airport uh, for fuel and lunch as well. And we'll be talking to the pilots about the discoveries we've made on the way. So I shall leave you uh, with that view and leave you with those thoughts. I hope that's been an interesting lecture. We have our Wales from the Sea book out this year, recently won a big award. And there's plenty of information about the 
uh, Seven Levels Landscapes in Wales and the Sea. And we also have Frank Golding's excellent book about the archaeology of Upland Gwent. And even there, you can still be able to find the Error Films book for Britain as well. So we have contact details on there, the Cov Lane database you can go to, my email address at work if you have any queries, and the Royal Commission's main website and our inquiry team as well there. So I hope that's been an interesting talk. Many thanks, Jochen Bauer.